Yes, it is. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Okay. All right. So it's a pleasure to have Tony Marie Alvarado uh, from Rice University that will tell us about quasi hyperbolicity, the explicit symmetric differentials. Um, well, thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's great to be here uh, this morning with you. Uh, it's, I guess it's morning for, for me, uh, but I see people from uh, all around. Um, yeah, so at first I, I was going to say I, I had originally intended to talk about something slightly different. Um, and, uh, but, but last week uh, I, I saw that there was already a talk on Campana points. And so I decided that we'd just talk about uh, uh, quasi hyperbolicity instead. Um, so I know that some of you have seen some version of, of this before, but I hope that uh, you, know, you, you won't mind the, uh, a second go around. So um, yeah, I want to talk about uh, sort of proving that, that certain surfaces of general type uh, have finitely many curves of genus zero and genus one. That's really sort of what, what this is about. Um, now, it was motivated by some very concrete problems uh, from number theory. So uh, one of which is, is the problem of uh, finding a, a perfect cuboid, that is to say a box, uh, such that the distance between any two of its corners uh, is a positive integer. This is something that um, we, we don't know if such a thing exists, and I will not answer that question in, in, in this talk. Um, but uh, variations, for example, on this problem were considered by Euler around 1770, um, where he looked at, at a similar problem, but he didn't require that this, this z uh, uh, direction uh, be a, a positive uh, integer. He only required that the um, the, uh, that the size and the face diagonals were, were integers. And there are perfect cuboids of that type. So, uh, but we do not know if there's, there's a perfect cuboid such that the distance between all of its corners is a positive integer. And of course, immediately when you see a problem like this, you start realizing that there are relations between these uh, variables. Uh, you can see all kinds of Pythagorean relations already. Um, and so if you, uh, if you start writing them down, you quickly realize that the existence of a perfect cuboid is, is equivalent to um, the existence of a rational point in projective uh, six space that satisfies uh, this slightly uh, winnowed down uh, set of, of equations. Um, these, these equations, they, this uh, form a, a surface and it's a surface of general type. I should say immediately that the surface has points, um, so which makes this problem really hard. Uh, because, for example, if I just take x1 to be 0 and I just collapse the whole cuboid to a box, then there are Pythagorean triples, you know, x2, uh, x3, and y1, for example, that, that'll do the job. And so, so this, this surface has actually plenty of points in it. What we're trying to do is we're trying to show that there exists a point that's sort of not a trivial point. I want no coordinates to be 0, for example. And so I want to avoid all the, the hyperplanes um, of, of the ambient space. Um, and that makes the problem hard. It's, it's usually much easier to show that a variety has just no points whatsoever than to show that it only has the points that you see. Um, so that's sort of one, one problem. And a, a related uh, problem is one of, uh, that involves magic squares. Um, I imagine many of you have seen magic squares at some point in your life, but let me sort of go over them uh, quickly. So uh, a magic square is an n by n grid. In this case, on your right, you will see a three by three grid. Um, where the uh, uh, sum of all the rows, all the columns, and the two diagonals are the same. And in this case, that would be 15. Um, on the left, you see a picture of a turtle that basically has the, the same magic square uh, uh, painted on its, on its back. And the, uh, the tradition has it in, in China that the, it was the emperor uh, Yu uh, saw this magic square paint on the back of a turtle around the year 2200 BC, um, and it's called the Loshu. It's a very sort of famous uh, magic square in, uh, in China. Um, anyway, so, so these things exist. I mean, you can see one right here, but what, we're, what we wanna do is we wanna consider a slight variation on, on the problem of, of the existence of magic squares, which is, can we find a magic square of squares? Meaning I want all of the entries to be um, squares of integers. 
and, and I want them to be distinct and, and non-zero. And again, this makes the problem hard because if you look at that square, I can just take a magic square that has all ones on it. And that would be a magic square of squares. Um, so so there, uh, as you can imagine, there is a, an algebraic variety, again, that parametrizes uh, these magic squares of squares. And this variety has points. For example, the uh, point um, where all the coordinates are one is, is a perfectly good rational point on this thing. And so, well, um, so here you should see there are six equal signs in P8. This is actually a, a, a complete intersection. So you get a surface again, and it's a surface of general type. And if you're slightly puzzled because there, you might have felt that there should have been seven equal signs, the, um, the point is that once you know that, for example, three columns add, uh, add up to the same number and two rows add up to that same quantity, then the third row will also be forced to add up to that quantity. And so there's a little bit of redundancy in, in, the, uh, in the equations that you might write down. So yeah, so, so these are sort of two very concrete uh, uh, problems. And, and we don't know, by the way, we don't know if there exists a three by three magic square of squares. This is actually still an open problem. And again, I, I will not be solving it today, but this is the kind of thing that, that has been motivating um, the, the research that, that was going into this um, into this talk. So um, what, what do we know or what might we expect uh, uh, happens, for example, on these, on these surfaces? What do we know about rational points on surfaces of a general type? Well, what we know is very little, but, but we have some deep conjectures about what uh, ought to happen. Um, so for example, if you have a, a nice surface, meaning smooth, projective, geometrically integral, um, which, by the way, these, these surfaces don't quite satisfy, but I'll come back to that. Um, then the uh, deep conjectures of, of Lang and Voida would imply that, that such a, a surface would contain only finitely many uh, curves of genus 0 and 1. And that outside of these finitely many curves of genus 0 and 1, there should be finitely many uh, rational points. And, and so, um, I mean, it's you know, part of this philosophy in, in, in a sense, uh, at least in this dimension is, you know, how, how do you produce rational points? Well, you know, maybe you're in some kind of like homogeneous space where, you know, once you have one point, you have lots of points, kind of like genus zero curves. Or maybe you have a group law. And so if you have a few points, you can propagate them by adding them together. And, and somehow this, this line void of philosophy is, is, is trying to tell you that, well, that's kind of it. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's hard to produce uh, rational points on, on, on these surfaces of, of general type when, when your global space is, is so uh, uh, negatively curved. So, um, so okay, uh, you know, so one thing we might try to do is, is see if, if at least, you know, we could prove that the surfaces that um, uh, parametrize magic squares of squares or uh, perfect cuboids, you know, do they um, satisfy something around the conclusion of these uh, Lamboida conjectures. Can we prove that there are only finitely many curves of genus zero and genus one? And, and if so, you know, are all the trivial points that we see, you know, do they lie on those curves, for example? You know, as, as sort of trying to build some evidence to, towards the idea that maybe these, these um, uh, magic squares of squares don't exist or that perfect cuboids uh, don't exist or that if they exist, they ought to be quite, quite rare. So now, um, oh yeah, so we're going to give this uh, phenomenon a name in this talk. We're, we're going to say that a nice surface, uh, I'll, I'll soften the hypothesis on nice in a bit, but uh, is algebraically quasi-hyperbolic if it contains only finitely many curves of genus 0 and 1. So there is a notion of algebraic hyperbolicity uh, out in the literature, uh, which is um, stronger than, uh, than we're asking for uh, here. But, um, but in particular, um, that, that notion out in the literature of algebraic hyperbolicity would imply finitely many curves of genus zero and one. And so we're, we're putting the quasi in there and, and sort of uh, modifying the definition a little bit to serve our, our purpose. So, so what do we know um, about uh, this algebraic quasi hyperbolicity? We actually have some remarkable results 
uh, I'll, um, for, for these, uh, uh, for this phenomenon. So for example, back already in 1977, uh, Bogomolov showed that if you have a, a nice surface um, where C1 squared is greater than C2, the churn classes, then um, you have finitely many curves of genus zero or one on, on that surface. Um, but of course, if you take something like, you know, some surface of degree greater or equal to five and P3, that it won't satisfy this, this inequality, you know, but we also know that, that those surfaces uh, are also algebraically uh, quasi-hyperbolic. These are, um, this follows from some genus bounds uh, due to Shu in, in 94. And uh, in fact, quite recently in the last couple of years, um, uh, uh, Izet Koskun and, and Eric Riedel uh, uh, were able to improve uh, Shu's uh, bounds to show that not only is a, um, a very general uh, surface in P3 of degree at least five algebraically quasi-hyperbolic, but it is also algebraically hyperbolic in the stronger sense that I didn't define for you. So, um, but I, I wanted to highlight this, this result because it's, it's really quite, uh, quite nice. Now, this is great. So <clears throat> there is, we, we do have some strong results, but as you can see, and I've tried to highlight in red there, the, the word's very general. And that's kind of a problem for us because we have very specific surfaces that we want to test against. And you know, the, um, the arguments in here tend to ask for surfaces whose um, Picard group is generated by the hyperplane class. And that's actually not the case for the surfaces that, that, that we have. So, so we can't sort of take these results off the shelf and, and say anything about um, the surfaces that we were interested in. We need something different if what we want to do is take a concrete specific surface and try to prove that uh, it, it is um, algebraically quasi-hyperbolic. So with that said, what, what I want to do is, is tell you a little bit about what, you know, what, what do we know about these, these surfaces that parametrize magic squares of squares and, and perfect cuboids. And this is all sort of a, a vessel um, to, to explain the kind of results that, that we get. So if you look at the surface that parametrizes magic squares of squares, remember it was, uh, it's a surface in, in P8. It's actually a complete intersection, but it is not smooth. Now, it has a lot of A1 singularities, um, which is called modal singularities here. Uh, 256 of them, they're isolated. Uh, they're sort of innocuous, but there's a lot of them. Uh, so that's a, um, uh, a feature or uh, the, that the surface has. Um, it is of general type and it does contain curves of genus zero and one. Um, so typically what happens is that what you do is you, you take uh, a bunch of these uh, A1 singularities and you find you know, hyperplanes uh, through them. And then that allows you to sort of cut the, the, uh, the surface. And then you see what sort of um, curves you get and, and, uh, and you often see curves of genus zero or one. And so this is sort of how these 368 curves were found. And all of the solutions uh, to the set of, um, or, or all the rational points that we know on the surface actually end up lying on these genus zero or one uh, curves. So, um, yeah, I, I, there's a question. I'm not very good at navigating the chat, but. Can you use one of the many automorphisms? Right. Yeah. So, so we we use that actually in in um, uh, sort of to make some of the proofs a little bit easier to in in our counts, I guess. Yeah. Um, definitely. So, just as a sample result uh, of this joint work with Nils Brown and and Jordan Thomas, um, that is is sort of still in in the pipeline being refereed. One of the things that we can show is that the uh, surface parametrizing magic squares of squares has actually only finitely many curves of genus zero or one. So this is sort of a, um, the, the, the paper has sort of two components. One is sort of slightly more theoretical, one is more computational. This result comes a little bit more on the theoretical uh, side of, of the paper. Um, it's not the only surface to, for which we can prove algebraic quasi hyperbolicity, but it's sort of nice that, that we could take sort of a, a surface that around a problem that people have thought about for a while and, and say something new. So, um, so that's the, uh, the, the kind of thing we'll be able to do. For the perfect cuboids, 
Can I ask, um, yes. does, does, the, does your proof give you a bound on the degree of those curves? Right, that's a great question. Um, not as currently written in, in the paper. Um, I but think in principle? I think in principle, with some more work, I mean, I, I, I should put an asterisk, yeah, you know, in principle with an asterisk, uh, yes. In, in the sense that, that you know, there's, there's a sort of resultant locus that you may be able to compute. And, and you know that, that these curves of genus zero and genus one will have to lie on this. And then you can try to estimate, for example, the degree of that resultant locus. Uh, and that, that'll give you some, some crazy upper bound uh, on, on curves of genus zero and one. Um, and so when, when we first did it, uh, we, we, we actually got a concrete number, um, but, but I think we, you know, it, it, it depends on, on a particular sort of um, graded ring being generated in low degree. Um, and, and we think that it's true, but, but we couldn't show it. And that's the asterisk that I was talking about. So that, that's why we, we didn't quite do it on paper. But I think in principle, uh, it, it may be doable. Yeah. So, uh, which would be great because then you can just start searching right, as well, uh, and, and so, uh, and see if you can get a complete list. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question, Jordan? Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. So, so for perfect cuboids, the story is a little bit different. The results are not going to be as sharp. This is going to be a bit more of a computational result, um, which I, I think is still actually really uh, quite, quite neat. So um, the surface parametrizing perfect cuboids is also a complete intersection of quadrics in P6. It is not smooth. It contains uh, 48 uh, nodal singularities. It should really be saying A1 singularities. Um, as we said before, it's a surface of general type and it does have curves of genus zero and, and genus one. Again, sort of obtained by uh, looking at, at sort of hyperplanes determined by some set of nodes. Um, and then you sort of see what, uh, what you get. Um, and so, in, and in fact, all of the uh, trivial perfect cuboids, the ones that have coordinates with at least one, one zero coordinate end up lying in one of these uh, 32 genus zero curves or 60 curves of, of genus one. Um, these, we were not the, the first people to, to write these down. Um, we, uh, Ronald Van Lauk had, had nicely written them down in, in his bachelor's thesis. I, I, I don't know to, to what extent these were known before, but, but in Ronald's thesis, everything is very nicely explained. Um, so we're not the only people interested in, in these perfect cuboids. There have been other um, uh, teams. And so I, I, I wanna highlight some of the things that, that they've done. So for example, Natalia Garcia Fritz and, and Giancarlo Utsua um, have uh, taken a crack at, at this problem using some of the the, a sort of similar orbit of ideas that, that we were using, but, but in the end, um, sort of use, using methods that, that we, we, we thought were a little bit hard, but they actually sort of came up with sort of cool ideas to, to try to, to uh, implement them. And, and for example, they were able to show um, that uh, any genus zero curve or any genus one curve on the surface that parametrizes perfect cuboids uh, has to pass through at least two of the nodes. Um, so that's, you know, that's a constraint, at least on the genus zero and genus one curves. I mean, it's not the tightest constraint that, that you can't imagine, but, but they can imagine, but it's, it's still, you know, uh, progress towards sort of uh, constraining that locus of, of genus zero and, and genus one curves. And so, um, we, so again, using slightly different methods, we um, uh, were able to improve epsilon on the genus zero um, uh, uh, side of things, but not on the genus one. So, so with uh, Nils Brown and, and Jordan Thomas, um, we showed that any genus zero curve on the surface parametrizing uh, perfect cuboids has to pass to at least six nodes. And, and it may be that it has to pass to at least more than six nodes. Um, and curiously though, as well, um, the, uh, the computational methods that, that we used will show you that there are finitely many genus zero or one curves in the surface parametrizing perfect cuboids that pass through at most um, 13 nodes. 
So um, these results actually sort of pull in slightly different directions. Um, but um, you know, it'd be great to uh, uh, bump up that 13 to 48, but we can't do that. That 13 is sort of the theoretical limit of, of what we were. What we Tony, were. Can, you, can you say a little bit how you got the constraint of um, the passage through the nodes? I mean, just a, an idea of. Yeah. Um, can I get back to you a little bit later once I sort of explain? Sure. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, um, all right. So these are not the only services for which we can say something. So here's a couple more um, that we want to showcase because uh, algebraic quasi-hyperbolicity was not known for these surfaces before. One of them is, is Barth's DASIC, which is a, um, uh, it's a surface in P3 that's really sort of arises from a polynomial invariant associated to the symmetries of an icosahedron. Um, and and that's, that's the equation of, of this thing. I'll show you a picture in a second. Uh, it's, it's a degree 10 surface in P3, uh, and it has 345 uh, A1 singularities, uh, which is a lot. In fact, there's, there's these famous bounds by uh, Miyaoka from 1984 that are uh, you know, quite general, but in this particular case, they'll tell you that if you have a surface in P3 of degree 10, it can have at most 360 nodes. And, and this 345 is sort of the closest we've gotten to, to Miyaoka's bound. We don't know what happens in that gap in between 345 and 360. Um, so, so this surface is, that, that's a picture of it. Um, so of course I, you know, it's really, there should be sort of like the other side of a cone coming out of all of those spikes. Uh, and, and that's only a real um, uh, picture. All, all the singularities are real, but many of them lie in the uh, plane at infinity. And so, um, uh, but still you can see sort of this is uh, a spiky kind of, of surface. And, and another surface for which we can prove algebraic hyperbolicity was uh, constructed by um, Alessandra Sarti in, at, at the beginning of the millennium, um, where she uh, constructed a surface of degree 12 in B3 with 600 uh, A1 singularities. And the theoretical limit for such a surface is 645 from Miyaoka. So, and this is about as close as we've gotten to, to Miyoka's um, bound. And again, the surface is constructed as, as some sort of polynomial that's invariant for a, a certain symmetry group uh, associated to a platonic solid, not, not quite of the platonic solid, but uh, so um, it's, it's quite neat. Um, I'll, I'll show you a picture because this is not my picture. This is, uh, it, Sarti actually uh, has this on, on her paper. So that's the, uh, a slice of, of that, that surface. Um, so lots and lots and lots of nodes. And um, what we do is, is again, we, you know, part of, of what we can show is that these two concrete surfaces um, are algebraically quasi-hyperbolic. So they contain only finitely many curves of genus zero or one. And again, these are not the only surfaces for which we can do that, but I just want to sort of showcase concrete instances because the whole point of, of these methods is, is that we're really taking a, you know, a, a surface that's given to us. You know, we, don't, we don't sort of get to, uh, to, to make hypotheses. You know? and, and so, so these are um, surfaces for which, we can, for which we can say something. So um, yeah, so how does this go? Uh, so let me, let me sort of try to uh, convey a little bit uh, about it. Yeah, so... Um, the ideas actually go back uh, quite a while, so the late 70s, um, and they're very simple in a sense, but I think in, in a way a lot of the computational power and computational techniques were just not available at the time. And so you know, they, they weren't used um, in, in a way to actually prove uh, concrete results on, on specific surfaces, uh, but now in the 21st century, you know, our, our computing power is much better, and uh, and we can still and we can say something now. So, so what's the idea? So I'm going to take a you know suppose I take a, a smooth projective variety of dimension n, x is it's going to end up being a, a surface, in the end, and then I look at omega one that's the sheaf of of uh, one forms, and I look at the projective bundle of hyperplanes. So this has a bit more of a tangent bundle feel 
then a cotangent bundle feel to it. And what we're going to look at is, is sections of this omega-1. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between sections of the sheaf of one forms and the, uh, a global section of the growth and deep bundle associated to the um, uh, projective, uh, the, I'll call it the tangent bundle. And, and if I have a section, then um, I, can, I can look at sort of its image, which is sort of a, the, a divisor of, of zeros in this, uh, in this projective um, uh, tangent bundle. And, and we're going to use these sections to actually constrain the uh, locus of uh, genus zero and genus one curves on X. So, so here's, here's how it's going to go. So if I have a, um, a nice curve, uh, now the image can be nodal if you want, for example, that's not a problem. So um, then if I have a map from my curve uh, to X, I can actually lift this map to, uh, to the tangent bundle. And uh, at least in the locus where f is not ramified, I mean, what, what are we doing? Well, to specify a point in this p of omega 1, I have to tell you sort of a point over x that we lie on. And so that's just going to be the, the image of little x in capital uh, x under the map f. And then I have to tell you a tangent vector. OK, so, so I, I look at you know, the image of my curve c. I look at the point. I look at a tangent vector that actually is enough data to specify a point. Uh, in, in the tangent bundle. And so, um, so that's, that's nice, but why, why is this uh, useful? Well, if you specialize to P1, um, then when you pull back uh, a, a section of, uh, of omega-1, you will end up in uh, global sections of omega-1 of P1. What omega-1 of P1 is O of minus 2, which has no sections. And what that means is that when you pull back um, your, your section, you get zero. And this is something sort of a very, uh, a very natural thing from the point of view of, of differential geometry. Really what's going on is that this, this section, remember that this thing has a tangent bundle field. What's the section of the tangent bundle? It's, it's some vector field. And, and so what, what this is saying is that the, this genus zero curve has to sort of flow. It's an integral curve, but integral in the sense of sort of differential geometry, not in the sense of, of, um, of algebraic geometry. It's sort of a, a curve that sort of flows through the, the, the vector field. And so that's, that's great. Um, that, so any genus zero curve will, will have to be a, an integral curve for one of these, um, these vector fields. So, so the picture, uh, let me show you the picture in the, in the next slide is, uh, is that so? If if anything, this is the picture that I that I want you to take. You know, you you have your curve C, you map it into X. If you have a section, uh, so if you have some nice vector field, then your uh, when you lift that map, the uh, the curve will have to lie on on the image of the section. Why is this cool? Well, if you have one section, it doesn't tell you a whole lot. But if you have many linearly independent vector fields, omegas then all of those different omegas are going to create different red hypersurfaces. And, the, uh, and my curve C is going to have to lie on all of those red hypersurfaces simultaneously. And then we can use that to try to constrain the locus of, uh, of genus zero and genus one curves. That's the idea, okay? So, um, Okay, so that's, that, that's sort of how we're going to try to, to attempt this. And then we have to navigate all kinds of, of, of subtleties that, that will appear. Um, but we're going to get stuck really fast. So, so even before we get to the subtleties, let me, um, let me tell you that, that this, this sounds like a really cool idea. And, and then you realize that, okay, this is not as easy as you think. Um, so, you know, again, if we had many linearly independent sections, that would be wonderful. But, you know, what's, what's the first type of surface you might try to apply this to? Well, take some smooth surface of degree greater or equal to five in P3. And um, well, there just not, there's not even one vector field to, uh, to get you started. And, and so, okay, that's, that's kind of sad. But you might not give up. You might say, okay, well, instead of looking at omega one, let's look at some symmetric differentials, okay? And okay, so that's, that's gonna be a little uh, funnier. Now, instead of getting a section of, of the O of one of the growth unique bundle, you're gonna get a section of O of M. And so it's gonna be like an M multi-section, um, but you st you'll still get that sort of you know, um, integrality 
um, uh, condition. And so, uh, unfortunately, if you take a smooth surface of a degree greater or equal to five and B3, it's still the case that there are no symmetric differentials. So, okay, um, great. So, so what now? And okay, so, so now comes sort of like the, the, the cool idea, I think, in, in uh, this paper of Bogomolov and Oliveira from, from 2006, which is if you think about all of the surfaces that I've been telling you up until now, they were all singular surfaces, right? They all had nodes. And it turns out that in the presence of a lot of singularities, um, you might actually pick up uh, some sections of, of some symmetric power of, of omega one, at least in the resolution. And so, so even though, you know, it's sort of the smooth version is, is sort of, you know, you, you get nowhere. If you start introducing these singularities, then, then you might actually, this, this idea might uh, find purchase. So, um, okay, so what they did is they looked at, uh, you know, you know, take a, a surface with uh, some, you know, specified number of isolated uh, Duval singularities, so ADE singularities. And um, you look at a minimal resolution for the surface. And what can happen is that, you know, sometimes uh, you, you do get uh, sections for uh, symmetric differentials on, on the resolution, at least if you have enough singularities and if you look at high enough symmetric differentials. Moreover, they showed that if, you're, if you have lots of symmetric differentials, if your uh, symmetric differentials sort of have an order of growth um, uh, that's n cubed, then, then both the resolution and the original surface are going to be algebraically quasi-hyperbolic. So what this condition is, is sort of trying to tell you is really that, that this omega one, this uh, cotangent, uh, the sheaf of one forms is big. And then you use that to actually take your uh, projective bundle and embed it. And then you have to worry about all kinds of things. You have to worry about the base locus, for example. Um, you have to study some bad fibers and things like this. It's, it's, not, it's not trivial to, to show that, that uh, X and, and uh, Y and X are algebraically quasi-hyperbolic once you have this, this level of growth. Um, but that's very cool. Yeah. Um, X and Y, X is a singular one and Y is a resolution? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, it's OK. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yep. Th this is X. This is Y. Thank you. Yes. Oh, OK. All right. So, so the questions, natural questions, is OK, like what? X can you do this for? And again, let me, okay, now it comes back up. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, how many nodes or, or how many singularities of whatever kind do you need to make this work? And how big does, does M have to be, for example, uh, to, um, to at least get some sections? So remember, if we get some sections, we can actually, you know, play with those sections. To, uh, to try to constrain the locus of genus zero and genus one curves. That's the kind of computational result that appears in, in the paper associated to this talk. And then the, the theoretical results are more along the lines of like, okay, don't ask how large must M be, just show that as M grows, then you eventually, um, you, you, I mean, the, the, you start hitting this um, growth like M cubed as, as M goes to infinity. Um, and so, uh, well, um, let me, let me show you. Okay, so, so how are we going to do this? Um, so we're going to take a complete intersection in PN of uh, multi-degree D1 through Dn minus 2. Remember that the surface of, that parametrizes perfect cuboids and the surface that parametrizes magic squares of squares were complete intersections of quadrics. So, so we're going to take all these Ds to be uh, 2. We're going to assume that we're holding in our hands a surface of general type. So that's this inequality uh, that you see right here. That's uh, saying that X is of general type. And we're going to have some uh, nice AD singularities. And this time, the X and the Y are in the correct place. So thank you, Julia. Um, so, so S is the set of singular points on X, and, and E is sort of the exceptional divisor in this, this resolution. And what we would like to do is to understand the, um, the, the growth of the dimension of the uh, vector space of global sections for symmetric differentials in terms of the singular set uh, and, and M. And 
the the key tool is is in some ways very pedestrian. Um, it's it's a, a Larry uh, spectral sequence for the resolution morphism and and the sheaf uh, of symmetric differentials on um, on Y. Then you have to sort of really study both the the low the long exact sequence of low degree terms as well as the actual pages of the spectral sequence. Um, it's it's a subtle calculation, but it's it's sort of you you turn the handle on on uh, on the spectral sequence basically. And and sort of what what happens is remember uh, there's there's a lot of of inequalities in here. So I'm, I'm just want to highlight first. This is the quantity we would like to study. Okay, and and the way we will try to access it is well, you know the Euler characteristic is is sort of something that's a little bit easier to get your hands on, and so then you want to understand you know the H1 of the same sheaf and the H2 of the same sheaf and the Euler characteristic. Um, now, luckily, the H2 is zero, uh, at least for, for M sufficiently large, M has to only be three for that to happen. And that's already, uh, that's a result in, of, of Bogomolov and, and Oliveira, and, and it's also in an earlier paper by Bogomolov with a different proof. Um, if you take the Larray spectral sequence for that um, uh, resolution morphism, and you study the low degree uh, terms, then, then what you will end up is, is uh, understanding the H1 of the sheaf we're interested in, in terms of, of two things, both of which look kind of nasty, to be honest. Um, there's an R1, but it's you're looking at global sections of an R1, uh, so that that is hopefully not so bad, that still has kind of an H1 feel to it. Um, and then there's a term that we really do not understand at all. And I want to highlight it in whenever I give a talk, because if we understood the term that you see there in a box with three question marks any better, um, it would automatically improve sort of all of the results and the scope of, of what can be done, both theoretically and, and computationally. So, so but, but it's, this, this is a term that I, I don't really know how to, um, to get my hands on. So all we're going to say is that it's the dimension of some vector space, so it's greater or equal to zero. That's not, that, that's very coarse. Uh, and there's a lot of information in that H1 that we're gonna throw away, sadly. Okay, now when we do that though, that means that the H0 that we are interested in, well, it's the Euler characteristic plus the H1 that we have to put back in, which is subtracted in the Euler characteristic. The H2 has gone away because I'm assuming, I'm gonna assume that M is greater or equal to three. And so the H0 that I'm interested in is the sum of some Euler characteristic and some H1. Um, it's really nice that I can um, uh, pretend in, uh, that this Euler characteristic is the Euler characteristic of a smooth complete intersection of type D1 through Dn minus two in, in Pn. This is, follows from a, a very nice result of, of a TIA that, that'll tell you that the, um, the resolution of, of x and just a, a good old smooth complete intersection of, of the correct type um, are diffeomorphic and these Euler characteristics are uh, uh, invariant under uh, diffeomorphism. And so the nice thing is that, um, okay, so this H1, this H1 we don't understand, but, but we had sort of the result of our analysis of the spectral sequence that, that tells us that I can replace the H1 with this crazy H0. And um, so, so now we have two terms. We have the Euler characteristic of a smooth complete intersection of the correct type in a projective space and this H0 term that amazingly we, we do know how to actually compute. Um, and this is, uh, that's, that's really the point. So the, the Euler characteristic um, of, uh, of a smooth complete intersection of the right type is something that one can calculate um, just by you know, opening up Fulton's book on uh, intersection theory and, and looking at churn classes. So, um, so you can we do that, and and that's that's the result. I, I wanted I want to show it to you for a surface of degree d in P three. Okay, so let me show you the next uh, uh, line as well. Okay, so this this line that you see here. That's the upshot from the previous slide. The, the quantity that we're interested in is the global sections of the symmetric differentials. 
And we've bounded it below by the Euler characteristic of a smooth complete intersection of the right type, plus some term that uh, is a little harder to understand. And, um, but, uh, but notice that, I mean, this, this term up here, right? I mean, this coefficient, uh, the moment D starts getting big, and by big, it doesn't have to be too big, uh, this is gonna be negative, and that's gonna dominate the, the count. And so, so the only hope, if, if you want this H0 of SM to be uh, positive, is that somehow this extra term that came from the Lorais spectral sequence um, is positive enough to undo the damage that, that this um, Euler characteristic of the smooth complete intersection has, um, has caused. And so, well, that, uh, that's our task is to show that, that you know, this, this uh, second H0 is in fact quite, um, quite large and positive. At least if you have enough singularities um, of the right kind and, and if M is, is particularly big. Okay, so I, there's a lot here, but a lot of it is sort of carried forward from the previous slides. The only new thing that is in here is in red. So again, X is a um, surface of degree uh, D. Now I'm gonna say that I have L isolated A1 singularities. Let me just sort of specialize to the case of, of A1 because those are the things that I was looking at in the concrete examples um, that, that we had at the beginning of, of the talk. Tau is the minimal resolution graph, the resolution morphism, sorry. The, um, we had the inequality that came um, from the uh, Larray spectral sequence we calculated uh, the Euler characteristic of a uh, smooth surface of degree D in uh, P3 uh, for the uh, symmetric, oh, this should, sorry, this should be a Z. Um, and, um, and then sort of the, the new ingredient is that, that we really can calculate this, this H0 um, that, uh, that was missing. And so we had L, L, a1 singularities, what I'm trying to tell you is that sort of this quantity is the contribution sort of from an individual uh, A1 singularity and there are L of them and they're isolated, which is why we can sort of uh, add, them, add them up. And so notice here, and let me stop highlighting in red because the, uh, it's gonna get confusing. Okay, there is uh, the leading term is, is 427 times M cubed. The leading term here, is, is quite negative as you know, if D is uh, um, already five, for example. Um, and so, but, but we get to play, right? We have L here. And so the point is that the, the D is fixed. Your surface is there. It has a degree. The degree isn't changing in a sense. Um, okay, well, the L, once you fix the surface, I guess the L is also fixed. But the point is that if you can find a surface of degree D where the L is really big, then 4L over 27 might overtake this coefficient. And then, and then you'll get the kind of growth that, that, we, that we are looking for. And so it's weird. The, the singularities turn into this just amazing feature of the problem, right? The, it's the singularities that, that save the day uh, and, and cause everything to, uh, to work out uh, correctly. So yeah, so let me... Um, uh, once, once we put this all together, right, what, uh, what this will say is that if you take a surface of degree D in P3 with L isolated uh, A1 singularities, for example, as long as L is greater than this nine quarters D times 2D minus five, then you will get algebraic quasi-hyperbolicity because the H0 will have order of growth M cubed, uh, which is what, what we would have needed. Um, and this, this method of, of proving algebraic quasi-hyperbolicity is actually genuinely different from two other um, uh, previous um, uh, methods in, in the literature. There's um, Bogomolov and Oliveira, which, um, so that, that paper has sort of a, um, a small combinatorial mistake uh, that sort of propagates uh, a bit through the paper, but, but all of the ideas are really there and correct. You know? And so you can sort of, once you fix that little combinatorial mistake, you can sort of see how it, 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 it um, you know, reverberates through the paper, but then you, you actually can still get a, a good estimate. 
And, and when you do that with their method, you, um, then you get a slightly different bound for the number of nodes that you need to be able to guarantee algebraic quasi-verbalicity. And then there's a method by Rouleau and Rousseau from 2014, which is sort of a, a more um, Campana orbifold uh, style uh, method. And, and they get a slightly different, um, slightly different bound. And this is always the point where I feel a bit like an analytic number theorist, um, which I am not, but uh, nine quarters is better than eight thirds. Okay, so right, eight thirds is like two point, oh my God, six, 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 right? And nine quarters is like 2.25. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that actually means, and it's the leading constant, okay? I guess analytic number theorists usually are interested in power savings and not so much leading constants, but, but the, you, you get a, a genuine improvement in, in the leading constant. And that's why, for example, uh, we can show that surfaces like the Barthesic and Sarti surface are algebraically quasi-hyperbolic, which was not possible with these previous bounds. They, they fell out of the range of, of, these, um, of these previous bounds. And so just to uh, you know, put, put in, in context, so if, um, so if you take D is six, for example, then, um, so you have a sextic in P3, you will need at least 94 nodes for this method to work. But there's no such surface. Miyaoka's bound will tell you that a degree six surface in P3 has at most 66 nodes. There is a surface also constructed by Barth as a, um, you know, some polynomial invariant, again, of a symmetry group of an icosahedron called the Barth sextic, which has 65 um, a1 singularity, so it gets really close to the Miyaoka bound, but, but the method that we have here is, is nowhere close to, to 65. And so at, at present, we cannot say that Barth sextic is algebraically quasi-hyperbolic. However, for the DESIC, um, what we need is 337 nodes, and thank goodness the Barth DESIC has 345, so, so we, it works. And for a degree 12 surface, you need 513 uh, nodes and Sarti surface had 600. So, so this is sort of how, um, why, why those uh, really work. Um, if you look at complete intersections of quadrics, and when we go back to the uh, sur uh, surfaces parametrizing perfect cuboids and magic squares of squares, so at least for the one parametrizing magic squares of squares, this is, this is how we are able to prove algebraic quasi-hyperbolicity. We uh, compute, you know, we, we have to do uh, the churn class computation again. It's, it's just kind of nasty, but you just do it. It's sort of an exercise. Um, and then we can show that uh, if you have, um, for example, say a uh, complete intersection of six quadrics in P8, um, then as long as you have at least 230, uh, 217 A1 singularities, then you're algebraically quasi-hyperbolic. And as it turned out, the surface that parametrizes magic squares of squares had 256. So you know, the, the proof of the result is 256 is bigger than 217. That's, uh, that's it. It's also worth remarking, I mean, that, that okay, so it's true that if you take a, uh, a complete intersection of quadrics in a high enough dimensional space, then you will get algebraic quasi-hyperbolicity. You don't need any nodes. Uh, a smooth one will do the job. But, but this, is not, this is not a new result. This was already sort of uh, follows, for example, from the work of Rouleau and Rousseau. Uh, so that was already, um, that was already done. Um, and sadly, as you can see here, uh, if I take a complete intersection of quadrics in P6, then we need at least 73 nodes um, for the method to work, but the surface parametrizing perfect cuboids um, only had um, 48 A1 singularities and 48 is smaller than 73. So, so that we, we got a bit stuck there. Um, so- Tony, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, you had this, you know, you're estimating uh, had the slower bound on the H0, the symmetric differential by the H0 of R1. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, uh, can you see the sections corresponding to that piece? Um, 
what they correspond to, or is that just really an, a numerical uh, estimate? I don't know if it makes sense. No, it, yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. So, so that is the sort of thing that we do computationally in the paper. Yeah, so you can you can actually try to, you know, uh, uh, okay. So now you have to sort of play with all the graded modules in the world to be able to to put this into a computer and see those sections. Um, uh, and uh, it's not quite that H zero of R one that 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 we use, um, but but something close to it. And that's actually how we get sort of the other type of results where we end up saying that it has to pass through at least two nodes, um, where where we really, I mean, what is it that we do? So, you know, to, to, to your question, I think this is a great moment to, to so, you know, you what you can try to do is you can try to compute the um, global sections of the um, sort of um, reflexive hull of the, so, so you, you have your symmetric differentials in the resolution, and then you can sort of push them forward and take a double dual. And you can try to compute global sections of that. Um, but that really is only sort of telling you what's going on outside of the, of the nodes. Um, and so uh, then what you want to try to do is, is so, so there you really can compute an honest basis for that vector space. And we do in the paper, you know, and it's, they're horrific, you know, you, as you can imagine. You know, and so sometimes you know there's a 13-dimensional space, and here's the basis, and it's you know it's just like a page of like ugliness, right? And so, but but it it can be done, which is amazing. So, and usually m equals two for like second symmetric differentials or something like this. You know, it's that that's about the end of what the line for what what is feasible on on like a desktop computer. Um, and then what you can try to do is see, okay, like can I push those those uh, sections and, and extend them over some of the nodes, you know, and, and sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. And so that uh, sort of the, that kind of careful analysis of when you can and when you can't is, is sort of the beginning of how we end up with a theorem that says that, that every curve is going to have to pass through at least two nodes. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So, um, yeah, so, so just to, um, finish up, uh, I just sort of, you know, let's let's go back to this. You know, what what, what would uh, Adlan Voida say? So, um, well, okay. So it'd be great if we could actually now enumerate the genus zero and genus one curves on this surface of uh, uh, magic squares of squares. Um, we we don't really do that, but you know, as uh, as Bjorn asked, you know, maybe it's it is. I think it should be possible to give a, a bound on the degree. I don't think it's like with what we wrote on the paper. It, it would it would be a very coarse bound on, on the degree, but I, I think it should be possible, and maybe you can refine it as well. Uh, but but you know I, I would expect that um, the all the trivial points that we see lie on these genus zero and genus one curves, and then Langvoida will tell you that well once you remove those curves, there should be finitely many points, uh, rational points left on the surface, and so maybe maybe there are only finitely many three by three magic squares of squares. But this is, this is really quite, quite a difficult uh, problem. Um, it, it seems reasonable to, to at least conjecture uh, this. Um, weirdly enough, of course, there are four by four magic squares of squares. This is um, something that, that uh, Euler found in, in 1770. And I, I love this example because he, um, he sent this to Lagrange explaining that this was a magic square of squares. Um, but without, you know, which you can verify, right? You can just add all the stuff up and check that this is a magic square of squares. We didn't tell Lagrange how he did it. Um, and so, uh, but then eventually he uh, gave some sort of presentation. I mean, I don't know if like a lecture was a, the mode of communication back then, but he made some presentation to the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences uh, later on uh, that year, and Lagrange managed to get a hold of some notes associated to that presentation. And, and so what, what went into the construction of this, uh, today we would express it as, as sort of saying that the, you know, the, the norm uh, on the quaternions is multiplicative, but well, they didn't know what a norm was and he didn't know what a quaternion was. Um, so, but he had that crazy identity that if you take the the sum of four squares, or the two numbers that are sums of four squares and you multiply them, you can rewrite that as a sum of four squares. Uh, 
And um, th that and sort of other ideas that are in there ended up, ended up sort of finding their way through uh, Lagrange's proof of the four squares theorem. So, so I, um, I'd like to think, um, I mean, that, that this magic square of squares at least played a role on, on a theorem that's fundamental that we tell all our, our, our students about in an elementary number theory class. Um, but you know, if, and if you start trying to find five by five magic squares of squares and six by six magic squares of squares, you find them. And then there's sort of a whole black hole of, of, of websites on the internet that try to find bigger and bigger magic squares of squares. But I think that, um, you know, it's, I'm not surprised somehow because uh, the, as, as, as things start growing, right? The, the number of variables grows like n squared. And so you're in a projective space that has dimension like n squared minus one. And, but the number of constraints that you're putting into these quadrics is, is growing linearly. And, and so these, these things very rapidly become sort of final. Um, and, and so I'm not too surprised that they're just packed with points. I mean, they're still very singular kinds of varieties, but it'd be nice to actually show um, once and for all that they do exist n by n magic squares of squares when n is greater or equal to four. Um, so that's that's it. That's that's what I have for you uh, guys today. So so thank you um, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, are there any more questions for the speaker? I guess you could say uh, what were um, Bagamala and Oliveira missing? Because I guess. Uh, they probably understood that calculation of r over one, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. Right? So, so they did. They didn't quite use the uh, the spectral sequence, but but yes. So so in, in some sense, they were doing a, a very similar calculation with the r of one. Um, it's it's just when they uh, try to estimate the uh, the dimension of the spectral space, they there's they reduce it to a certain count of monomials with a particular property. And there's sort of there are overlaps they don't take into account in in that calculation, and then it, yeah. But it's it's funny though because what ends up happening is that that there the the mistake is is very subtle, but but it ends up as you add sort of the various terms that you need the um, some some of these order of n cubed things actually cancel out. Uh, exactly, which they were not supposed to cancel out. And so, for example, in the paper, they end up saying that the barthesic, it's a barthesic, is algebraically quasi hyperbolic uh, because of this, this thing. And, and it doesn't quite work. But yeah, so, and of course, yeah. And, the, and this is just for A1 singularities. But, but even there, sort of getting the combinatorics right is kind of a pain. Any other question? I guess I have a question. Um, in a, in that you had that slide where you had uh, the contributions of that H zero of R one for mm -hmm. each of that node, mm -hmm. and uh, and so do you do you have similar things for other Duval singularities, even just for for cusp, say two singularities? I mean. Does that improve? Does it help you to consider other uh, singularities or or not? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So yes, yeah, so for example, I think Dolivera and uh, a, a postdoc of his, and I'm blanking on his name. Um, they did the calculation for A two singularities, and and you really get sort of extra mileage. You you need sort of fewer A two singularities. Um, yeah, so the the contributions sort of get better, and I mean, we, it'd be great to, you know, just do AN, do DN, and then there's E6, E7, and E8. Who knows how terrible those are? But, but presumably, I mean, I, I'm pretty certain that, that just like there was this sort of polynomial, there we go, this one. So, so this, this, this is sort of the end, the end result for the A1 singularities. There's going to be, you know, some polynomial looking thing like this for A2 singularities for AN, DN, E6, E7, E8. And as long as they're isolated, they will sort of play together. And so there's probably some nice formula 
that just says if your surface has AD singularities, you know, and it has, you know, L, L sub n an singularities and d sub n dn singularities and this many e6 and this many e7 and this many e8, this is what you would need to, to guarantee uh, algebraic quasi hyperbolicity. Um, but, but that involves some pretty tricky counting problems. So this is where if you have sort of a, an amazing like REU person who knows how to, uh, how to do these sorts of things, that, that would be, be kind of neat. Um, yeah. Thank you. Other questions for Tony? All right, then we can thank Tony again for the beautiful talk. I'll stop the recording now. Maybe. Hmm. How do you stop? Oh, yeah.